do barber and I'm like how hard could it be you know I was like, yeah I could do I do men's hair and I lied I didn't know what I was doing you can't be hungry if you're being fed men don't take women seriously in the barber world it's just what it is because they think you're a woman you should be doing women's hair or you know it's really hard and like when a guy sees a woman in a barber shop he doesn't want to go get a haircut from her he just wants to look at her if you haven't picked up something from everyone that you work with man you're missing out and the one day I had that one client nobody wanted to come Ooh, sit in my chair tough nothing and I was like I'll stay open to close waiting for a walk in anything if you do sacrifice that you pull it off it you lead to something that you did which is something a bit greater than where you're at at the moment you just get to that next level which is hard that's why that's why not everyone gets there but you kind of need to do have to have a strong mind it's not easy I've had guys that turned me down in front of my face I've had even like moms like women that were rude to me because they didn't want me cutting their boyfriend or their husband or even their son they're like you should be at the desk you should be sweeping you shouldn't be here like it's hard Hi. Hi, hi, hi. Let's get stuck in. Welcome everyone to another episode of Hot Talks. Today, my special guest is a speaker, educator, entrepreneur, brand owner, business owner, hairdresser, barber. If that's not enough, all the way from New Jersey, Lena Piccinini. Hi, guys. <laughs> hey, thank you so much for joining on today. Thank you for having me. We are having beautiful summer weather today. What's it like over there in New Jersey? Doesn't look so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> a little, it's like a little summertime. rainy. Oh, that's awful. Well, yeah. thank you so, so much for coming on. You've got such an inspiring story. You're a special character, I think. I've been following you for ages. So I want to share your story with people. And I want to take you back to the very beginning because I know you had quite an interesting um, story into how you got into the hair world in general, let alone hairdressing barber, which we'll go into a bit later. How did you actually get into the hair world? Well, if I'm being honest, <laughs> I actually yeah. went through um, a vocational school in high school just to be able to leave two of the classes during high school because I, I was just not good at school. It wasn't my thing. So I was like, I'm yeah. kind of good in here. Maybe I'll do vocational school so I can get out half the day. And I ended up really loving it. I started working at a salon and I was like, I think this is my thing. That's awesome. And then what, what did you then go straight to hairdressing then and then you deferred over to barbering? How did that work? No, so I was working in a hair salon, and um, I was uh, an assistant, I was receptioning, I was like shampooing, everything like that, and I was only mm. uh, around 17 years old. Um, when I was 18, my dad actually passed away, so Sorry I- Sorry to Yeah, thank you. Um, so I had to take over, you know, our house with my brother. My brother was carrying the weight for both of us. I wasn't really helping much. And, you know, I was like, I need a job that's going to give me quick money. And at 18 years old, I didn't have a clientele. So I wasn't making that much money at the salon. Around the same time, um, they switched owners. Like they had somebody else kind of run the salon and he wanted to cut my pay down. And I was like, this is the worst time for my pay to be cut in half. I was like, I need to find something else. And my brother was, you know, always telling me like, go work at like Home Depot or something or somewhere where there's a good paycheck. And I'm like, I don't want to work at Home Depot. I'm a girl. I'm, you know, I want to do hair. A friend of my father has actually owned a barbershop. And I had no idea he was a teacher, but he actually owned a barbershop also. And he happened to break his shoulder. So he reached out to me and he said, you know, I know you do hair, do you barber? And I'm like, how hard could it be? You know, I was like, yeah, I could do, I do men's hair. And I lied. I didn't know what I was doing because in cosmetology, they don't teach you anything about barbering, you know, so I had no idea how to barber. Yeah. So I started, um, and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't working at the time. So he said, you could start tomorrow. And I was like, okay, great. So I went online and I, you know, was Googling clippers and stuff. I had no idea what to get or what to use. And I started the next day and I seen, you know, all these people doing clipper work. And I'm like, oh my God, I have no idea how to do this. So I was trying to take all the long haired clients and try to do as short as I could with like shears. I was very comfortable with them. But I started realizing, I was like, I need to, you know, figure out how to fade. So I you know what, I think I just jump in on that, but I was just going to say, I think that's a really good way to start, by the way. Try and like oh, mess, mess it up, get really tight with the scissors and the comb, and then it, the rest is easy. Yeah, I knew I was comfortable with that. And where that barbershop was, it was actually a lot of kids and gentlemen's cuts. Mm. So it wasn't so, like there was like, I don't think any skin fades. So I've never even seen, seen a skin fade. I didn't even know that was the thing. <laughs> yeah. So once winter came, it was more of a summer shop. So winter came and it got really slow. And, you know, I was like, I need, I need to make money and make steady money. Yeah. So at this point now, I think I'm a barber, right? So I asked a lot of my guy friends, you know, where do you guys get your hair cut? Where do you guys work? And they're all looking at me like, you can't do these cuts. I was like, yeah, I'm a barber. I work at a barber shop. 
So um, my one, one of my friends recommended me another shop in um, New Jersey that was like really busy. So he said, I'm going to introduce you to the owner. I'm going to have you come here. So I lied to him and told him I was a barber and I've been barbering for a couple of years and I've had clients, which is a lie. So he's like, <laughs> okay, we're going we're gonna to start you off with one day. And the one day I had not one client, nobody wanted to come Ooh, sit in my chair, tough. nothing. And I was like, I'll stay open to close, waiting for a walk-in, anything. And I remember I did my first fade and it took me almost two hours and it was horrible. And I was like, I don't, I don't know what to do. So I realized when I worked there, I was like, I really have to step up my game and learn how to fade. But when I started the barbershop, I saw how much money was walking in. I saw, you know, so many walk-ins, so many appointments. It was e not easy money, but it was quick money. Yeah. Rather in a salon, clients come back less because they don't need their hair done as often. So I saw an opportunity there. I was like, if I really, you know, figured this out and learn how to barber, I can make great money and I can be busy like these other guys. So I would just watch them, you know, but it was, it was hard. You know, uh, yeah, it, it's, it sounds like a really tough beginning. I know a lot of people that are going to watch this back, a lot of people go through really tough beginnings. But, you know, it does, we're going to go into this later, but obviously, like, you've, you've done quite a bit with your career, for, you know, further down the story. And I think, you know, it reminds me of a saying where it says, um, you can't be hungry if you're being fed. So I think, you know, your hunger is going to be massive into what you do later on. And obviously, you're showing signs by saying, well, you know, I did that because I needed the money. So I figured that if I do that, you know, and then it leads on to what you're going to do next, which is how did you then really learn to be a barber? What did you, how did you pick that up? And what tips would you have for people who are really struggling to get into like the fade game and building a clientele? I feel like you, obviously practice makes perfect, but you have to have an eye for it because the steps of fading are very easy. It's, you know, one, two, three, four, four, three, two, one, it's all numbers and it's low to high, high to low, but it, you have to have an eye for it because if you don't, you're not going to really pick up what's it like, how to make that fade clean. So for me, because I did hair and I was doing makeup, I, I like related it to makeup because, you know, for a lot of women, like a lot of women barbers were like, that makes so much sense because you blend your makeup, you see where there's dark spots, like in eyeshadow or things like that. And I was like, where you can point out dark spots in eyeshadow, you have to do that with hair. Yeah. So a lot of, you know, it was, I got the steps down, but it was applying it to every client. And like, if they had a dent in their head or if they had, you know, coarse texture, coarse texture hair rather than like light blonde hair it's different. So it really helped me out was honestly just like, I would just watch them because back then they didn't really have what they have now, like the YouTube and the tutorials. It wasn't big like it is now. Mm. So I would just stare at the barbers and I'm like, all right, he's using these different blades. And why is he zoning in on this one section? And I was like, Oh, he's zoning in because he needs to make that lighter to make it even. So it started just clicking in my head. So for me, I was like, I need to get the fade down before I get the time down. So I was like, I don't care if this person's in my chair for an hour and a half, I'm going to give you a clean fade. And then little by little, I'll build up my speed. Yeah. But what really helped me, I went to, um, you know, Pacino. So I started following him on Instagram. And that was when he started doing his classes. And he was from Florida. And I was like, Oh, my God, they're having a class in New York, I have to go. So I ended up going there. And that's where I met him. So I his class helped me out a lot. And then he had the app, which helped out a lot. But it was him and then paying attention to the barbers I worked with that I really it really clicked. You know what? It's huge. I always say whoever I work with, I learn all the time. You can always learn when you're watching everyone else. There's always something you can pick up. It doesn't matter how, you know, where they are in terms of their and Especially education. that everybody cuts so different. So I was mm. watching so like eight barbers and all of them cut differently. They started differently. They used different clippers. They had different methods. So I was like, I picked up something from everybody and I was like, I need to apply this. And then I figured out what worked best for me. If you haven't picked up something from everyone that you work with, man, you're missing out. That's why I say. So yeah. for those, I mean, Pacino is obviously is huge, but obviously in the UK, maybe not so much. We don't obviously use this product so much over here. So tell us who, yeah, so yeah. what is, <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so um, for the UK people that's going to watch this in the European. So Pacino's more of a, did it start as a barbershop and then a hair product brand? He yeah, started at a barber. Um, he started doing hair shows, then started doing celebrity hair. And then from there, he opened, I, I think, like two shops and then just started teaching. He started promoting like classes and just helping other barbers learn how to feed and stuff like that. And then he decided to come out with the app on the phone. So that was tutorials, which the first app was just him doing all the tutorials. And then he asked other barbers to come film for the app. And that's where I started working with him. And then he started his own product line. Was that was that your first step into educating? Yeah, so when I when I met him in New York, I was one of the only females in the class. And 
he already followed me on Instagram and he said, you know, your haircuts could use a little help. He's like, but I like the fact that you're always working. So either I was posting haircuts, I was doing weddings, I was doing makeup, I was doing women's hair. Like I was always just my Instagram from start to finish or from like the beginning was very professional. Like it wasn't like partying and drinking. It was always like work. So he said, I like the fact that you're always geared towards work. You're always like, you're always busy. You're always doing something. And he's like, you know, we have a lot of women. It would be cool if we had a woman that would teach. And I was like, oh no, like I, I still, I'm still learning. I can't teach anybody. But a couple weeks later, he asked me to film for his app. And he's like, you know, I'll be, I'll be there with you. You can bring your own model or we'll pick out a model for you. And he's like, I think it's really cool that if you, you know, came on the app and I was featured as the first woman. But that actually went horribly <laughs> because I was supposed to do a scissor cut because he said, I told him, I was like, you know, I'm not really comfortable with fading. Um, I don't feel comfortable someone learning from me when I don't, you know, I'm not really 100% yeah. on it. He's like, why don't you do shears? We have a lot of barbers that they don't go to school. They don't learn how to do shear cuts. So I was like, oh, okay. My model actually canceled and I had to do, end up doing a fade of one of the barbers that worked for him. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> it took me almost three hours, I think, to do that haircut. I had wow. all the guys in the shop were just standing around me watching me. I was so nervous, but I mean, it ended up being really good. And then after that, he asked me to go to California and teach a class. Awesome. And that's how I started getting into everything. And then his manager, Sergio, started managing me. And then we started teaching. How does it work having a manager in here? So he, because then when I started working with Pacino, um, people started reaching out to me and asked me to do classes. And, you know, oh, I didn't okay. have a contract. I didn't know, like, how much to charge or what, <laughs> like, I should be asking them. And so he basically just managed that. Like, he, he did all my bookings. He did, like, the back and forth. He made sure everything was set. All my contracts were good. Do they find you work? Yeah, I mean, we were all promoting each other, so it helped. Okay, yeah. so going back into the way like you got spotted and you're saying your, your profile was quite professional and stuff like that. Do you think it's difficult for women when they first enter, like especially more barbering? Obviously, it's like a very male-dominated industry, especially like now it's getting a bit less, I'd say, but especially when you started, do you think a lot of women try to overcompensate with other things to try and grab attention on like their social media page other than just their work because it's difficult. Yeah. But I just never, I never went down that road. That's just not how I am. Like, I feel like it's it, like men doesn't like men don't take women seriously in the barber world. It's just what it is because they think you're a woman, you should be doing women's hair or, you know, it's really hard. And like when a guy sees a woman in a barber shop, he doesn't want to go get a haircut from her. He just wants to look at her. You know what I mean? So sometimes I've seen that women, you know, will dress a certain way just to try to get more men to come to their chair, but that's not the clientele I want. And that was never the clientele I wanted to get. So I never did that. You know, at the end of the day, you're cutting somebody's husband, boyfriend, father, mm. son. So I always say you want to just be professional and make them come to you because of your work and nothing else. You know, I kind of noticed that about your profile before where your images, like even if you're you're, you're like dressing, you, you know, you want to look good for your pictures like everyone does, like men or women. I've always felt that with your pictures, you never really try to overdo it to try and sell. I think it's sad people are trying to like sell sex in a way kind of thing because yeah. they think it's going to get them more of a following. Because um, you can still look, you know, sexy or good, you know, good and whatever without trying to do that. It's a shame because, you know, there's no reason why a woman isn't such, as good as a barber as a man. And then there's no reason to do that. You just kind of like degrading your brand a bit I think by doing that so I, I think that's really strong what you did I kind of picked up on that so yeah that's that's a really good thing so with how do you think it works when you start out as um, a woman in barbering what do you think is like the tools that you need or the mindset you need to then kind of overcome these obstacles what kind of things are you facing when you come into it what do you I kind mean, of need you definitely to do have to have a strong mind it's not easy I've had guys that turned me down in front of my face I've had even like moms like women that were rude to me because they didn't want me cutting their boyfriend or their husband or even their son they're like you should be at the desk you should be sweeping you shouldn't be here like it's hard and I was like you know what but what what makes a man able to barber better than a woman you cut hair with your hands there's nothing different you know what I mean so I'm like I have to just really I felt at a time that I had to be better than the men like I have to really step it up for people to take me serious but it's hard, you know, and I have a lot of girls that reach out to me. They're like, how do you, you know, I'm just, I, I'm down on myself today because of this. And I'm like, you have to just make your work speak for itself. And it's going to be hard. And, you know, we're in 2020, but it's still, <laughs> unfortunately, men and women are just not equal still. And that's horrible. But if you let your work speak for yourself, and that's it. Like now so many women are barbering and 
even like now I still get people that look at me weird when I say I'm a barber. They're like, oh, you do women's hair. I'm like, no, I, well, now I do both, but I was yeah. like, no, like I cut men's hair. Like I, you know, they're, I don't know. You just have to have strength <laughs> and positivity <laughs> and be positive and be strong. And that's, that's about it. And then that worked out for you because you end up getting really busy as a barber, right? And yeah, then so when I first started, because like I said, it took a couple of years for people to start coming in my chair and being comfortable with. And then it even took a couple of years for even the guys at the barbershop to be like, no, she's good. You're in good hands. Like, <laughs> we're busy. You can go to her. Like, she's good. So I took advantage of the haircuts that nobody else wanted to cut. You know, when you're in a barbershop, I feel like a lot of barbers want all the skin fades and beards. Yeah. So I was like, I'll take all like the older men. I'll take all the seniors. I'll take the kids. I'll take all the sheer cuts. And by then that started building my book because, you know, the older guy has a son and a grandson, you know what I mean? Or the kid has a father. And I started building clientele that way. Is that, I think that's actually a really good tip on how you start building a clientele in the first place, right? It's yeah, like take a lot of people are picky, you know, they want to just mm. do one cut. But at the same time, I feel like that's not good because now with all the trends changing, the kid that once had a skin fade now wants an undercut with long hair. Or, you know, the guy with long hair now wants a skin fade. Like, I feel like all the haircuts are starting to kind of morph into not like a different gender either. Like, now women want shorter hair. Men want longer hair. So I feel like it's good for, for even hairstylists to know how to cut shorter hair and men how to cut longer hair. And I feel like yeah, that, yeah. that helped me by starting, you know, with the longer hair and then kind of transitioning to fading because now my clientele is so diverse. Yeah, because so you are super busy. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah definitely uh, we're seeing different trends i mean like now if you think being topical in lockdown people are growing their hair some people might go back to a barbershop and might not want a skin fade they might be like what can you do with this and you're like oh i've never done hair like that before i don't know you know so you never know when you're gonna get caught because, out um because i just had a baby so i went on maternity leave awesome. right before this started happening so yeah. a couple of my clients actually said i'm just gonna grow my hair out until you come back and I'm like, <laughs> so they actually started growing it out. And then my last haircut with them was just cleaning it up to help it grow longer, like it's like from a different haircut. So a lot of them are growing it out from a skin fade. So then I yeah, yeah, yeah. everything for them to keep growing it. So I think that helped them out. But I know a lot of people growing their hair out. And I know a lot of people that are getting haircuts on the side. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know if we should go into that. I mean, like, that's actually a huge topic over here at the moment in the UK. I mean, I it's a bit of a thing where it's like mm, you probably shouldn't i don't really want to comment on anyone's personal situation like some I people are having sides. a tough time yeah it's hard because you know a lot i know a lot of people have just started opening shops and that's really hard or you know and people that really do need the income like i understand especially everything with the like the disability or like the unemployment they're taking forever because everybody is trying to file for it that they're not getting anything they're not getting any money in so i understand people have to do what they have to do but me personally i'm not gonna do any like haircuts on the side i don't want to put my family in jeopardy god forbid you know what i mean so mm -hmm. i see both sides but it's hard because you could lose your license if you get caught you could you know get fined which is more money you have to pay that you're not getting in so yeah i'm, I'm with you on that to be honest yeah, I'm with you. So you then, if I, when I was when I was watching, looking at your stuff on your profile before, I see you're heavily into barbering. You're doing stuff with, you know, different brands, Pacinos and whatever you're educating. And then we fast forward. I your profile comes up, and I'm seeing long hair, and I'm thinking, yeah. this the same person? And now, <laughs> like, you know, you've got like a product range. It's hairdressing. What happened? Because it's very it's very impressive to do both really well. A lot of people can do both, but to do both really well and to be successful in one. And also, just quickly add, isn't it scary leaving barbering at first, like pure barbering, like not doing hairdressing, when you're doing so well at it and it's bringing you an income and you're thinking, actually, I'm going to broaden myself here because you could risk, obviously, destroying your barbering brand. Did you find yeah. that at the time? How did it all happen? Yeah, it How did really it all happen? Hard. So I was working at the barbershop and I was like touring and doing everything and teaching. And then at the barbershop, I got, so then I got extremely booked. Um, I could, you know, I, I was solid booked. I was making as much money as I could. So I'm like, okay, what do I do now? And I couldn't really change the prices. Um, we raised the prices a little, but that still wasn't helping empty my book a little. I'm like, I'm just solid booked. I don't know what else to do. Like, is this like my peak? Like, what do good, I do Good now? problem to have, by the way. Yeah. So instead of, you know, staying comfortable, if I felt like I was still like on the go, I was still being ambitious. And I'm like, all right, so I got to just keep going. If I have the energy to do this right now, I'm going to figure out something else. So I'm like, maybe 
I'll go back to women's hair <laughs> and like jump back into that. So I knew a couple of my friends worked at this one salon. Um, but it was, you know, I didn't have any women clientele. I had a little bit, but at the barbershop, you can't do color. You can't really keep up yeah. with it. And a lot of women don't feel comfortable getting their hair done, you know, with other men. So I was taking a chance, but I'm like, you know what? If some of my guys follow me, like, great. If not, I have to rebuild my book. And at the time I was living alone, I had all my own bills. So it was like a huge chance that I was taking to like leave the barbershop where I was comfortable that I was at for like seven years, you know? But I was like, I have to do it because if you don't make yourself uncomfortable, you're never going to grow. Mm. And, um, but actually, so I, I ended up moving to a salon and a lot of my men followed me and like little by little, I picked up a lot of men from being in the salon, just of other women that were there that were like, oh my God, you have to go to this girl. Her, the character cuts <laughs> are great. So I actually got more men than I really thought I was going to, but yeah. you know, the, like the haircuts change in the barber world, but if you know how to cut hair, like if you know how to barber, you could figure out how to do the haircuts. But for women, yeah. there were so many new techniques and trends with color that I wasn't learning being in a barbershop. So I really wanted to go back to the salon to like, I wanted to just learn everything. I wanted to be able to do color and barbering and makeup and just have everything under my belt. It's just, I was just interested in all of it. So but I went back there, you know, that's where like the ombres started coming out, the balayage is like the different color techniques. And I learned a lot being in the salon and now my book is everything. So it was hard. And I, I've been at the salon now for, I think November will be five years that I'm there at the salon. So my book is exactly what I wanted it to be is everything. Kids, you know, seniors, color, makeup, barbering, everything. Because I just I think I get bored sometimes doing the same thing over and over. So I wanted it to be extremely diverse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's like me. You're always itching to do something new. Never settle. Um, get you into trouble as well. What about, yeah. so you still do makeup? <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Still do makeup as well? Yeah. So we have like the proms and weddings. I do weddings uh, on the side. Yeah, like a lot of hairdressers do. I've got to say, you know, you, one of my previous guests said something really similar to you and about like switching from something that they were doing that was successful already and then kind of like almost jumping to another ship. It's, it's quite scary. It's really difficult to do that. It was hard. Because I actually, I struggled with it for a while because I was like, what if I don't, you know, I, what if I had no women that come in? Because women, they yeah. don't come like, I have a lot of clients like the guys that come every week, every two weeks. So at least I know I'm getting that money. With women, they can wait, especially now with the color, they do less maintenance. So they could come every four to six months. I'm like, so what am I doing if they don't, if I don't have a lot of women clients, you know? So it was scary, but I knew that I had the hustle and the drive to make money regardless. So I knew I would be okay, yeah. but I knew it would be hard at first, but it worked going, out. Going back to the beginning, you had the hunger for it, right? So if you're being fed, you can't be hungry. It's, yeah. it, it's, it is impressive. Like I said, one of my previous guests was saying something really similar. And if you do sacrifice that, you pull it off, it, you lead to something that you did, which is something a bit greater than where you're at at the moment. You just get to that next level, which is hard. That's why, that's why not everyone gets there. So you that now have um, a hair product brand, female yes. product brand. Is that right? I use it in a lot of men also. I use a lot in their yeah. beards and in their hair. A lot of my men too have long hair. It's not just all skin fades. So I was, I was trying to figure out to come out with something for years and I just, I didn't feel a hundred percent on it. You know, I was going to do a hairspray, mm. but like I wasn't, eh, I was just kind of like not a hundred percent. I was going to do a men's product, but it's like, I don't know. I wasn't leaning towards that. So then I took a break for a couple of years. I was like, I'm not going to come out with anything. Like maybe that's just not for me. But then I started realizing that I was like, if I'm going to come out with something, it has to be something I need. Like, I need to use it. I'm not going to just come out with something just to try to sell something and make money. Like, it needs to be something that I really think works and something that I could use every day. So when I started doing women's hair or just using products, I started cocktailing a lot of products together, like two different serums or two different this to, like, make, to make it how I wanted it in the hair. So I was like, maybe I'll come out with a serum that I don't have to cocktail. I could just use one serum. <laughs> so... I was working with different labs and then Pacino actually recommended me um, a lab in New York. So I met with him and I started talking about things that I liked, different products that I liked. And we started, it took a year to make my product. A year? A lot of, it was a lot of trial and error. <laughs> <laughs> because Why he, did... does, he does the chemist part with all, you know, yeah. the ingredients, but he doesn't know how that's actually going to be on hair. So nope. he would, he would send me samples and I'm like, this doesn't, this is actually making the hair worse or this is too greasy or too oily or it didn't do what I wanted it to do. So it was a lot of back and forth and back and forth for probably like eight months. 
Yeah, it, it is quite a shock. Um, I've had a little dabble in what you're talking about. And if you haven't done like a product range before, it is a lot of back and forth and way longer it's than you expect. Yeah, way money. longer. <laughs> hey, a lot of money. Yeah. yeah you got, got, you got to have a good like, You know, and I wanted to make sure that, especially now, I, I saved all the money to do my brand. Like, I don't have an investor. I didn't want somebody else to put money into it. Like, I saved money to do this myself. So, you know, if something goes wrong or whatever, like, I, it's, it's all on me and that's it. That's all I wanted. But it's a I lot like of it. money. And even, you know, if I, like, for, I have my bottles actually here. <laughs> nice. But, even just like the artwork on the bottle and to change the yeah. font, like that's money to change the color. Yeah. That's money, a different size. That's money. Like all the back and forth is money. So it's really expensive to do your own products. And a lot of labs you have to buy in bulk. You can't just buy like, I'll start with a hundred and see how that does. Like I had to buy like 2000 products starting and with all the artwork and everything is a lot, but I really believe find- in it and I love it. So I know it's going to do good. <laughs> Uh, no doubt. With, do you find when you're doing your product range, you, like you said, you, you hit something there that I, I'm, I went through when I opened up my shop and my branding, which is when you're going back and forth with your design, your logo, the product, do you get to a point where because every time you want to change a tiny thing, it's money, right? Do you yeah. find sometimes you're getting something and you're kind of like questioning yourself, should I actually send that back and change it because it's going to cost me again? Should I just stick with it? Did you ever get that? A little, but I... I feel like I'm very easy at picking things. So when we did my fonts, I like, I picked my own font and sent them a picture. I said, I want this font. So if you could find something similar, do that. So that was easy. And then she sent me basically say like eight different fonts. And like, I could just look at something and like, I feel it in my gut that that's it. So it doesn't take me a long time to pick something. So it actually like the bottle and the font, everything was like very quick for me. Like I could look at a picture. I'm like that one. And that was it. But like some people go back and forth and back and forth. But I, I don't know. I just, I, I picked it really quickly. I don't know how. <laughs> <laughs> why? The one thing I was wondering was why did you go more for like, why didn't you go for like a men's range specifically, first of all? I don't know. I think honestly, because I like to make things more difficult for myself. But yes, you do. Yeah. <laughs> I think everybody expected me to do a men's product, which I, I'm working on one now. Um, but unfortunately the labs are closed, so yeah. I had to wait to order it with everything going on. But, um, I don't know. I really, I was just using that a lot and it was more like something like a hair care rather than a, like a product, like a gel or a pomade. It was more like, so you could use this before you put pomade in your hair, or you could use this with everything. And I feel like with my clients, like I was using it in women, I was using it in beards, I was using it in men. Cause then now a lot of people like wearing their hair natural more than like a lot of heavy, hard product. So that's why I went towards that. And then I knew I could also, if I do come out with a men's product, I could use both at the same time. But I just, I felt like I wanted to do that first. It was just something (laughs) that I felt like. (laughs) Yeah, make things difficult for yourself. Why not? Um, (laughs) With, what's the, what's the name of the brand? Sorry. Uh, Manan. Manan. Where did you get the name from? So that was actually a nickname that my dad called me when I was younger. So oh, nice. my whole family calls me it. So my whole family knows what it is. Close friends, like they know the name, but a lot of people are like, I didn't want my name on it. First of all, my name is way too long. Lena Piccinini. It would, my bottle would have to be gigantic, but <laughs> I, didn't want, I just wanted it its own brand, but my brand, but not my name. Um, but it was just, that was just something that meant a lot to me because it was a nickname my dad called me. So Very and I nice. it had man in it too. So it could be manly. <laughs> <laughs> I like the way you're thinking. You know what else I think is quite cool? You can have peachy on a product. I think that's quite cool. Sure. Yeah. It's catchy. That, is it? That's what I was going to have. And I oh, really? Just, yeah. Like, his, um, like Pacino peachy. and all them would call me peachy. Like yeah. Like I'm surprised. So I started like branding that, but I don't know why I went with Manan. It just was. Is it Italian? Piccinini? Italian? Yeah. I'm half Italian. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Very cool. So you are actually pretty much European anyway. So welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, right, you got your hair range, you got all this going on. Did I see you did a talk for um, Babes in Business? What was that yes. like? So that's um, it's kind of like a whole like women's little community of like women entrepreneurs, especially small business owners, like in this area. So one of my friends actually recommended me to like check it out, and I went to one of the shows and I happened to speak. And it's it's awesome because it's all in this area. She started branching out, I believe, in other, like maybe New York and like a little bit farther away, but it was a lot of New Jersey and it was just women get together and like they, they help each other with business tactics, Instagram stuff, you know, kind of how they started, 
and it's good for women or anyone actually in general that wants to start a business and that maybe is like nervous or doesn't know what to do. And it's awesome because we all help promote each other and you just get a lot of networking. It's a great networking event. What do you think really helped with building your social media? Well, now I feel like it was almost easier years ago because now with the yeah. algorithm, it's impossible. I feel like it's nowhere near what it used to be, which is really mm. hard, but it is what it is. But I just always kept posting. And I remember when I would be sitting at the barbershop board because I'd have no body to cut their hair. <laughs> I was on Instagram and I was like, all right, I would ha look up the hashtag of the town my barbershop is in and start liking people's pictures. Yeah. And I'm like, maybe they'll look at my page and see that I cut hair and maybe they'll come in. And I actually had a lot of people that would come in from Instagram. And yeah. that's how I started building my page. And I would just use my hashtags, hashtag everything. I would hashtag like everything in the picture, like hair, haircut. I would hashtag the surrounding towns, maybe even surrounding businesses, like everything in the area. And that helped me build my clientele and helped me build my Instagram. But it was, yeah, I think it was easier back then because it was new. Everybody was following everybody, you know, but now it's like, it's hard to build it, but it takes a lot of work. I've been, since Instagram started, I've been building my Instagram. Yeah. So how, like, uh, at least 10 years ago, right? I don't remember when it came out. It was, it was, it was, it was different and it was easier. I think it was easier anyway. You're right. It's different now. When you post a picture, it's nothing like the exposure that you used to get. So. No. What's it going to be like going back now, being a, like I always find, because I started in the hairdressing background, hairdressers are are brutal. I mean, they're strong. When they have kids, they're like they're not like other moms. I feel like they work even harder. Like it's like they're super women. What's it gonna be like now going back as a mother? Is it gonna be? What did you expect? I don't know. <laughs> well, it's just <laughs> now too. It's like going back as a mom, and then also going back from quarantine. So I have I don't know. It's gonna be hard, but because now. It, I'm going back, but not full time. So I feel like that's that was going to be hard trying to get everybody in and fit everybody in in almost half the time that I had before. But then now it's also when we do go back because of all the restrictions, we all have to change our schedules. So I worked out my schedule to figure out when I would come back to work. And now we all have to change it again because you can't have as much people working. So I honestly think it might be better for me because then my hours are going to be shorter so I could go home and be with my son. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. But did, I don't know. It's, it's going to be hard. Did you work late into your pregnancy as well? Like how far in did you get up to? I worked up until, I don't remember. I was due end of March and I left, I left beginning of March. So I was, I started my maternity March 1st and I was due March 25th. Um, yeah. Now I realize I definitely worked too long of a day and I did too many people in a day because you know, a lot of people are like, this is your first rodeo. You've never been pregnant. You can't book yourself like that. <laughs> but now I think my second pregnancy, I'll go a little less and then I can probably work longer. But I think I did too much that I was like, I can't even stand anymore. <laughs> Typical hairdresser mentality. I'm telling you, they want to do everything. Yeah, it's hard. Because What's... I have a lot of guys too. So it was hard. Yeah. Like, I didn't get breaks. Like, you know, if you do a color, you could sit in between. Like I was booking myself solid all day. And I'm like, this is, this is horrible. <laughs> You know, something I never thought of, because now, like, now that everyone's closed, people always get worried. As barbers and hairdressers, they always get worried. If you take a long duration out of your uh, workplace, you lose clients, potentially. Does that, does that ever happen when you go, like, for maternity? Because I never thought about it that way when yeah. you're on maternity. I have, I have some clients that started coming to me on somebody else's maternity leave and never left. Yeah. I mean, it's a risk you take. And even, so with my guys, um, <clears throat> sorry. I don't have, we didn't have another barber in the salon. So I had to find, you know, other people to cut their hair when I was on maternity leave. I mean, now it doesn't matter because nobody's getting haircuts, but I took it. I'm taking a chance still of like my guy's not coming back because I recommended them to somebody else. But I like, but I'm like, I know that my book will get filled no matter what, just because I'm just, I'm extremely busy, but I also, my book is open to everybody. So if that guy doesn't come back. I know somebody else will come in. So it's a, ch a chance you take. And like everybody takes that chance. I took the chance too when I was traveling a lot, you know, when I was teaching, because there would be a lot of weekends where I w wasn't here. And a lot of people want their, you know, every week or their every two weeks, not that day, that time. So it's, I feel like that's just what the industry is, you know, or if a lot of women get that too. If you're just busy for one day and you go to somebody else, you have a chance at even one time, then not coming back. 
Yeah, I, um, I think now for the first time, all the men are now experiencing what it's like to be on maternity leave. You're aware you've got no clients. <laughs> That's what happens. Yeah. <laughs> and you get worried about it. It's, it's rough. But... Is what it is. I mean, that's great. L listen, that, I mean, what you've done so far, I think, is incredible. I really appreciate your insights. You've got the product range going on now. You said you might have a men's range going on soon. Yeah. Yeah. So I actually, so, I already, I basically just have to order it, honestly, because I worked on that for probably five months. That was actually quick. I was surprised how quick I picked out the product I wanted to do. Um, I'm not going to say what it is. Yeah, but yeah. I keep it out, secret. I took it out quick because you have to do like the product, the scent, the color, everything. So, so I'm excited for that because I know that will do good because I definitely wanted to have a men's and a women's, but my and my women with short hair could use this product also. So both my all yeah, my definitely. products are going to be for it's going to be gender neutral. So. Do you think Do you think it'll it'll come over to the UK? I would hope so. <laughs> you gonna send us some? Yeah. <laughs> we'll try it out. Cool. We'll look out definitely. for it. Listen. When you get it done, send it over. Look, we'll post it as well. We'll want to test some new products out. We're always uh, looking for new products. Awesome. Uh, so, listen, thank you so, so much. I won't take up any more of your time. I really appreciate you being on to, uh, on here. I think your story is very inspiring. We're looking forward to what you're going to do next. Um, yeah, yeah, good luck over there. When are you guys opening? Or oh, you don't have a date yet, do you? No, we don't have a date yet. So as of still now, we're still, hopefully July. <laughs> but I don't think... Connecticut actually got a date and they ended up pushing it back. So I don't think, you know, I think they want to wait until they're 100% certain. I don't know. We're all just kind of hanging out, waiting. Yeah, I it's July 4th. I get, spend, I get to spend all the time with my son, so I don't mind it. But I am yeah. excited to go back to work and catch some hair. Yeah, yeah it's good timing. A friend of mine, he just had a baby. So he's like, I don't really care because I just get, get to spend time with a baby. I wouldn't have done that otherwise. So yeah, it's good timing for him. Yeah. Listen. Thank you so much. I hope to keep in contact. You take care. And guys, if you're watching this, click subscribe onto YouTube, share, check out Lena's page. It's under Manan uh, Hair Care, right? Not Lena, Lena Piccinini. No. It's Manan Hair Care, yeah. Manan Hair Care, yes. Manan Hair Care. Check it out. Check out her products. It's good stuff, man. Cool. Take Thank care, you. everyone. See you later, Lena. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.